Welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Um, the class today I'd like to uh, give should be in the uh, merit of those in the Ukraine, all the Jews that are suffering, and uh, God should help them. Again, uh, it's my hope and my belief that this is the ikve, the footsteps of the Messiah, and let's hope that he comes quickly and with as little pain as possible. So, let's begin. So, the uh, my thought this week will be on humility. In Hebrew, that is uh, bitl, or as the Israelis would say, bitul. So, uh, this is important, and we'll see why later. Uh, the my thought this week will look at the concept of humility. I don't think that it is an accent, that the Hebrew word for humility is anav, spelled ayin, nun, yud, and vav. Now, its spelling is very close to the Hebrew word ani. Ani is a poor man, spelled ayin, nun, yud. Now, the only difference between the spelling of these two words is the letter vav, at the end of the word anav, humility. The Hebrew letter vav is shaped like a hook. This hook is what, so to speak, connects the upper world and the lower worlds together. The vav in Hebrew is referred to as vav hamachaber, which means the vav of connection. Uh, the vav also possesses the function of inverting the apparent tense of a verb to its opposite, which is from past to future, from future to past. Referred to is vav hamahapach, the inverted vav. So it is the letter vav that alludes to our ability through our actions to connect the past to the future and the lower world to the upper world. It is the vav, the letter vav, that links words to form sentences. It joins sentences into paragraphs and chapters, connects one chapter to another, and even unifies books. Some commentaries call the vav an elongated yud. Now, yud is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So what does this connection tell us? Our sages tell us that when God created the universe, he created the upper world, the seat of spirituality, with the Hebrew letter yud. This was seen as an allusion to his humility. Many commentaries see the Vav as a sign that God drew spirituality down into our material world to infuse it with a spiritual battery of sorts. So if the origin of this material world is humility, huh, then who are we to be arrogant? When we read the Torah, referred to as the blueprint of this world, we observe immediately that the name of God is only mentioned as the third word in the opening verse of the book of Genesis, of Bereshit. One would have thought that his name would be the first word mentioned. After all, that is who he is, the beginning and the end of everything in creation. Not only that, we see that when Ptolemy, the Syrian Greek leader, commissioned the 72 sages to translate the Torah into Greek, the Septuagint, they changed the order of the opening words. They put God's name first. They were concerned that if the Torah would be translated literally, it would read that Beratius, whoever he is, Bara Elohim, created God. So to avoid any confusion whatsoever, they wrote, God created in the beginning. So what do we learn from the fact that God placed his name as the third word in the opening verse instead of the first? God is teaching us humility. Imagine, if God Almighty, the creator of the whole universe, is humble, <laughs> then how can we mortal human beings be arrogant? Arrogant about what? All of us are fragile, mortal human beings. We are all codependent. We are, we are far from perfect. You know, they still tell the story about the Kotzke Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Mendel of Kotzke. There was a certain individual who came to see him. The man told the Kotzke, that he was plagued with arrogance and that he was seeking advice and how best to overcome his challenge. Well, the Kuska told him to take a seat in the corner of his study. He then told his attendant to bring in the next person waiting for an audience with him. The man, a farmer, entered the study. He noticed the man sitting in the corner, but the Kuska told him to take a seat, and so he did. He told the Rebbe that his cow had stopped giving milk and that his family relied on that cow for their food and income. The Rebbe turned to the man in the corner and said, Answer him. The man shrugged his shoulders and said, I know nothing about cows. 
The Rebbe turned to the poor farmer and asked him what he was feeding the cow. When the Rebbe heard, he told him to change what he was feeding his cow and everything would be fine. The farmer thanks the Rebbe for his time and advice and he left. The assistant then brought in the next person who was, willing, who was waiting to have his audience with the Rebbe. He too noticed the man in the corner, but the Rebbe told him to take a seat. He told the Rebbe he was feeling weak and that he was having trouble sleeping at night. The cuts could turn to the man in the corner and said, tell him what to do. <laughs> the man replied, I'm not a doctor. I, I don't know what to tell him. And so the Mokotsky prescribed a regimen for the man to follow. He told him to eat certain foods and avoid others and to exercise daily. The man thanked the Rebbe for his advice and he left. Kutzka then told the assistant to bring in the next person waiting to speak with him. And again, the man entered the study and he saw the man sitting there in the corner, but the Kutzka just motioned for him to sit down. The man began to tell the Rebbe that his business was faltering and that he was losing money daily. The Kutzka turned to the man in the corner again. He said to him, tell him how to make his business profitable once again. The man looked totally confused. He said, I know nothing about his business. So the Kutzka gave the man advice on how to run his business more efficiently so that it would be profitable once again. And with a big smile on his face, the man thanked the Rebbe and he left. After he was gone, you know, the Kutzka turned to the man who was sitting in the corner and he asked him, I, I, I don't understand. How can you be such a Balgaiva, such an arrogant person? You seem to know nothing. Sadly, this is the truth that many of us share. Whatever we do know, no matter how much that may be, it is still a drop in the ocean compared to all the knowledge that is found in our world today. Most of us are spiritual paupers, an ani. The only way that we can lift ourselves out of our state of spiritual poverty is by adding the vav to the word ani, poor person, and changing it to the Hebrew word anav, a humble person. Humility forms a best vessel in which God Almighty can pour his essence. Once we acknowledge just how little we actually know, then we can grow. Once we connect to our source, God Almighty, then we have the ability to reach up to the heaven and bring it down to earth with the letter Vav. You know, I was watching a lecture on YouTube by Y.Y. Jacobson. After the lecture was over, an Israeli woman approached him and said, that the essence in life is bitul. He heard her, but he thought that she had said the Hebrew word bitul with an Israeli accent. And, and, and so he <clears throat> excuse me, noted and said the word bitul, as we do as Ashkenazim. She corrected him and repeated her statement again. It was all about bitul. She, he still didn't quite understand what she meant. And so he repeated it again, but this time with an Israeli pronunciation, bitur. She shook her head and, th and then she said it slowly. And now he understood very clearly what it was that she was saying. She said to him, be atur. He smiled and nodded his head in agreement. And he repeated the words, be a tool. The essence in life is to be a tool. We must all be a tool in our service of our Creator. What is a tool? Well, Webster designs a tool as a device or implement, especially one held in the hand, used to carry out a particular function. We use different tools for different projects. A doctor's tools are, are much different than a plumber's tools. However, neither can succeed in their profession without the use of their own unique tools. There are people who are similar to tools. Others use them for their own selfish needs and desires. The idea becomes to be useful without being used. What is our mission in life? The Torah is very clear when it states that God took us out of Egypt from the house of slavery so that we could serve him, our king, our father in heaven. As we say daily in the second paragraph of the Shema Yisrael, it is said to love the Lord our God, your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. We have only one master, God Almighty himself. There is a saying that goes, Evid Melech Melech, the servant of a king, is a king. God wants us to emulate him. 
He has given us his Torah and instruction manual for us to know what it is that he expects from us. He has chosen us as his firstborn child, B'ni B'chori Yisroel. It is a well-known fact that firstborn children generally have more responsibility and challenges than their younger siblings. They, have, they are, so to speak, the trailblazers. Parents invest a great deal of time and effort into grooming their firstborn child, guiding and instructing them about values and morals, what is right and what is wrong. They then expect their eldest child to instruct and monitor their younger siblings so they too will follow the same proper path, the drill sergeant. God wants us to be a light unto the nations. He expects us to lead them by example. We are God's tools. He has commanded us not only to study his Torah, but he expects us to practice all that it demands. As it states in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. Rip Shimon said, the lo ha medrash iker el hamasa. It is not the study which is primary. It is the action. Just like a tool in the hands of an artisan has no free will of its own. A hammer is a hammer and a saw is a saw. They are only effective when they are used for their intended purpose. And so too, too with each and every one of us. God Almighty expects us to observe all the laws that he has written in his Torah. It is not optional. <laughs> it's mandatory. We all have our own special mission, but all missions have one thing in common, in that we all need to be a tool for our Creator. Just like Avram Ravino, Abraham our father, the person who introduced monotheism into the world, we too need to lead the world in a quest to bring heaven down to earth, being an example to Jew and Gentile alike. In Devarim Rabbah 3, they, they tell the story about Shimon ben Shatach. In olden times, rabbis would work menial jobs to support themselves and their families. Shimon ben Shatach was a hauler. His students, realizing that the rabbi was getting a bit older, decided to buy him a donkey. So they went to the marketplace and purchased a donkey from a, an Arab merchant. When they presented him with the donkey, they noticed and somehow around the donkey's neck was a chain, and on that chain hung a precious jewel. The student said to Shimon ben Shatach, Rebbe, look how much God loves you. He too wanted to add to your gift. He refused to keep the jewel. Instead, he returned it to the Arab merchant. When the Arab merchant saw the exceptional honesty of Shimon ben Shatach, he said, Blessed is the God of Shimon ben Shatach. He became a tool of God. Mission accomplished. In our daily lives, we too have many opportunities to be a tool of God. I always find it strange that when, when you watch a prize fight, after the match is over and the commentator is waiting to interview the winner, more often than not, <clears throat> the fighter, before he will answer any question, will first thank God for his win. Somehow we Jews, God's firstborn, feel a little embarrassed when we use God's name. We need to stand tall and be seen. We need to, to lead, but, but quietly, by saying a blessing before we eat anything or thanking God when we exit a bathroom for a healthy, functioning body. Our lips should always be moving, thanking God our Father in heaven for all the many blessings that he constantly bestows upon us daily. <clears throat> Excuse me. We should always smile and greet people pleasantly. We should be proud to put a mezuzah on our front door we should be aware of its significance as we gratefully reach up and kiss it when we enter and when we leave our homes. When we sit with our family and friends at our Shabbat table, we should open up the drapes on our front window that faces the street. By doing so, we can hopefully illuminate the outside world with the light of our Shabbat candles, bringing up children that are respectful to others and who display proper character traits, all ways that we can be a tool to God. What we refer to as a Kiddush Hashem, a sanctification of God's name. When we abandon people in need, well, guess what? They cry out to God and they ask him, Keli, Keli, Ma'azavtani, dear God, why have you forsaken me? When we help a person in need with a donation or a loan, some advice, a shoulder to cry or just an ear willing to listen, 
When we serve as God's tool, then the recipients are not only grateful to the tool that helped them, but also to the craftsman, God Almighty, who has supplied them with assistance in their hour of need. Interestingly enough, humility is not a mitzvah. Once one says they are going to be humble, well, they are no longer humble. We all need to be a tool for God. A tool has no ego, since it knows that without the hands of the craftsmen, they are useless. It is the craftsman, God Almighty, that gives us our purpose. I would like to finish off this, my thought, with a thought about Purim, the holiday which we just celebrated. When we look at the story, we see that both Mordechai and Esther made themselves a tool for God. Mordechai by refusing to bow down to the evil Haman, and Esther by putting her life in jeopardy when she presented herself before the king without a prior invitation. She did so in the hope that she would be able to persuade the king to save her people from total annihilation. What I find most interesting is that the two, th that the two things that brought Haman to his deadly end was Lushen Hara, tail-bearing, and Gavva, arrogance. If you look closely at the wording of the Megillah, we read that when Haman was appointed to the position of viceroy, the king ordered that everyone should bow down to him. Everyone did so. Hmm, <laughs> everyone except for Mordecai. Hmm. It seemed that Haman had an idol that he wore around his neck. He did this so as to be able to entrap people into Odea Vodazara, serving an idol. Since anyone bowing down to him would, in essence, be, be bowing down to his idol. Again, it would seem that from the wording in the Megillah that Haman may have actually been aware that Mordecai wasn't bowing down to him, but he may have chosen to ignore it. After all, Mordecai was a minister to the king. The words used in the Megillah are Ka'amram, when they said, and Vayagedulo Lahaman, and they reported to Haman. Through their tail-bearing, Lashen Harib, they left Haman no choice but to acknowledge the fact that it was only Mordechai, the Jew, who would not bow down to him. This may well have been seen as disrespectful to Haman's image. So now that this fact had become public knowledge, his ego may have compelled him to deal with the situation. One man. It was only one man that didn't bow, and yet, because of that one man, his arrogance blinded him, and he lost everything, even his life. Not unlike modern history with Saddam Hussein and his fall from power in Iraq. So let us learn from the story of Purim to speak, pardon me, not to speak Lush and Hara about others and to try to be a tool for God Almighty and not ourselves. And with that, let us do our part in being one of the tools that God will use to bring in the coming Mashiach Sakeno quickly and in our time. Again, let me bless you all. You should have a good week, a safe week, a happy week, to be prosperous. And again, that our brethren in the Ukraine should suffer as little as possible. It's not possible not to, I guess. But that they should be saved by God. And again, this should be the steps to bring the Messiah when the world will be filled with peace wherever, wherever we live. Thank you again for attending. God bless and be well. Shabbat Shalom.